Hello, friends, and welcome to the Nature Wander podcast. I'm Paul, your host, and today I want to thank everybody, everyone who has been listening, who has been referring friends to the podcast, anyone who has supported us in any way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it so much. It really feels good when I see those numbers creeping up. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about springtime again. Spring is just around the corner. It's it's coming. I know it is. We keep getting hit with more snow here in the Northeast, but it's coming. I just have that feeling. It's just around the corner. And this is the time of year where I start enjoying watching the birds. And matter of fact, I'm sitting here recording this, watching the birds. Just had a crow fly into my bird feeders. Got a morning dove. I've got some... Looks like black-capped chickadees out there. So quite a few birds. I've probably got, oh, there's a red-breasted nuthatch who just flew in. A couple of blue jays off in the tree watching. They'll be in a minute to chase everyone else away. There's a junco, lots of different birds. And that's what I want to talk about today is how to attract birds to your backyard. Another crow just flew in. Now I've got two sitting up in the tree watching me, watching them. So anyhow, we have... And up in the sky, I've got a red-tailed hawk circling. Yeah, they're going to start doing their mating rituals pretty soon. Spring really is in the air. So how do you get these birds into your backyard? I get asked that quite often. How come you're always telling me about all the birds that are hanging out at your bird feeders, that are hanging out in your yard? I can't get anything. And I get calls from people or texts from people, emails. Everyone's asking, well, what happened to all the birds in my yard? Why don't I get a wide variety? Why There's so many questions about the birds, and it's so easy to attract them. You just need to know how. Now, when you're trying to attract birds to your backyard, you have to think about, well, why would they want to come to my backyard? Why on earth would they want to come here to this place? Food, habitat, shelter. And that's actually the best way to attract a wide variety of birds to your backyard or front yard or side yard. doesn't really matter. You want to attract these birds by giving them something they need, a habitat. Three things make up a really good habitat that will attract birds and other wildlife as well. Not just birds, but if you're trying to attract other wildlife to your yard, These three things are the essentials for doing it. First of all, you need food. Birds need to survive. They need food. They are finding food out there in nature, and that's why they're out there in nature. But if you want them in your backyard, you need to give them food. That brings them into your yard. And I'll break down each one of these in a few minutes. So food is very important. Water is another thing. They want to have water to come to your backyard. And the third thing, shelter. Shelter is very important for two reasons, hiding from danger and raising young. So let's break these down. The first thing is food. Birds, wildlife, they're out there trying to survive, get to the next day, and then the next day. They need to have food. Birds especially, very high metabolism, so they need to keep nourished. If you're trying to get a variety of birds, maybe you have just blue jays come to your yard all the time, and you want to get the woodpeckers, you want to get hummingbirds, you want to get all kinds of different birds, a wide variety. Well, the best way to do that is to supply a variety of food. So if you provide a variety of food, you're going to get a variety of birds. It's that simple. You provide one type of food, you'll get a few different types of birds, but not a whole lot, not a huge variety. So that's key to getting a lot of birds. Now, maybe you just want a specific species. I tried for so many years to get Orioles. The Baltimore Oriole, I wanted to 
get them to my yard. Everyone kept talking around me. Oh, I get Orioles all the time, and they're beautiful orange birds. How do you get them there? Took me a long time, but I finally got them by being species-specific. It's like hummingbirds. Maybe you don't get hummingbirds to your yard. Well, they're not going to come to a suet feeder. They're not going to come to a seed feeder. They're a nectar eater. So if you provide a hummingbird feeder, they're going to come to your yard. So you can get species-specific as well. Now I want to talk a little bit about the difference between natural plantings versus feeders. Because you can provide food in either way. By putting plantings, maybe a bush, maybe a tree, maybe a tree that has a lot of berries or a bush that has a lot of berries, maybe flowers, different types of plants can attract different types of birds. So if you're trying to provide shelter and food, my suggestion is to go with plantings. Now, plantings will provide both. So they provide shelter. They provide food, but they also provide beauty to your yard. So if you don't want some ugly bird feeder hanging from your tree or hanging in your yard or in your garden, then go with natural plantings. They're much prettier. Also with natural plantings, there's less maintenance. You don't have to fill them. You don't have to clean them. But there is a downfall to natural plantings. You can't move them. They're stuck where they are, unless you want to dig up that bush and move it every year. Now, feeders. Feeders can be moved easily. They are also provide a variety of food. That bush is only going to produce one type of berry. A feeder, you can put dried berries in it. You can put suet in it. You can provide a variety of different foods. And once again, if you want a variety of birds, you need to provide a variety of food. Now, there is a little extra care with feeders that you don't have with natural plantings. For instance, cleaning and filling. Yeah, you need to fill your feeders, even if it's the middle of winter and you have a foot of snow on the ground. You need to get out there and fill them. Otherwise, the birds aren't going to come. So keep the feeders filled. You have to do it. That's also an added cost. So you're going to be spending more money on bird food. And you need to clean them. A lot of people don't. And you can run into problems if you don't. My recommendation is to clean your feeders in the winter time, maybe once a month. Maybe once every other month. But in the summertime, I recommend doing it every other week. Try to keep your feeders clean. That way you won't be spreading disease from one bird to another. So let's talk a little bit about water. Provide water for the birds or other wildlife so that they have a place to bathe themselves clean and also for drinking. Consider the species that you're trying to attract when you're providing the water as well. Providing maybe a small little bird bath, you're not going to get big crows or ravens coming to that bird bath. You won't get herons either, which some people don't want the herons. So if you provide a big half-acre pond, you're probably going to get herons coming to that pond. Expect your fish to start disappearing. But if you provide a smaller pond, you won't get the herons. Maybe a green heron, but you won't get the great blue heron. And maybe that's what you want to avoid, is getting these bigger birds. So the bigger the water source, the bigger the birds you're going to get. Maybe you're looking for the big birds. I have a half-acre pond on my property. I also have a couple of smaller little water pools next to my house. The smaller birds like those water pools. The larger birds like the big pond. The one day I was just sitting outside, osprey. Large osprey just swooped in, grabbed a fish out of the water, a large fish, and carried it away. It was exciting. Kind of sad to see one of my fish go, but it was exciting to see the osprey. So you will get those with a larger water source. Now also remember your space. Maybe you live in an apartment. You don't have a big backyard. You're not going to put in a half-acre pond then. Then you may want to go with a small bird bath, something that fits into your yard. 
Or if you have a large enough yard, but you live in a village, you can't put in a big pond, put in a small water feature. That'll attract the birds. It gives them a place to bathe, gives them a place to drink as well. And the third thing, shelter. I talked about shelter being very important. The main reason it provides a place for the birds to hide. Gives them a place to get away from any danger. Hawk is flying over. All the birds are hanging out at your bird feeders. They have no place to hide, no place to get away. They're easy targets. Those birds are going to be picked off by that hawk easily. So make sure you have somewhere for them to hide away, for them to fly away to, some place for them to get away from that hawk. It's also a place for them to get away from the elements. It's raining. You have a storm, the wind. They need a place to get out of that weather until it goes away. So a place to hunker down until the weather gets better. Give them some sort of shelter. It's also a great place for them to raise their young. They build nests in the bushes, up in the trees, or maybe you put nest boxes up. It's a great place for them to raise their young safely. Now, once again, I'm going to get into the difference between natural versus man-made. Once again, with the natural, you plant a bush, plant a tree. Pine trees are great shelter for the birds. And they grow rather quickly, too. So you've got a nice place for them to get away, a nice shelter in no time at all, even if you plant something small. So this shelter, natural, it looks pretty. It's a wind block at times, and it provides shelter for the birds. But once again, you can't move it. Man-made would be birdhouses, bird boxes. So you put up a bird box for the bird to nest in, but you are limiting yourself. I have 26 bluebird boxes on my property. The larger birds aren't going to use them. Basically, I have wrens using them. I have chickadees using them. I have tons of tree swallows using them. And I do get usually two or three nesting pair of bluebirds using them as well. I am limiting myself to about four species of birds. But those are the birds who are usually going to use them to nest anyhow. The robins and some of the other birds, like the orioles that I hear in the woods, they're using the trees. They're using the woods to build their nests. That's their shelter. So they've decided, hey, I need a natural shelter. So you are limiting yourself with man-made. But always try to give the birds some sort of bush, some sort of shelter, some place for them to get away from the weather, get away from danger. Now, I've got about 30 feet, 40 feet from the woods. That's where my bird feeders are. So they can dart quick enough off into the woods. But I also have a few plantings closer to my feeders as well. So they always have a way to get away from any danger. Now, if you can't decide between man-made or natural, you can do both. I have both in my yard. And I also put what I call man-made natural as well. What do I mean by that? Okay, so I'm clearing the trails in my woods. And I've got branches over them from a windstorm. I toss them aside. A lot of times I'll drag some of them out of the woods and I stack them at the edge of the woods. I make a small brush pile. And that brush pile is awesome. The reason, because not just the birds use them, a lot of different animals use them. They're easy to make. I'm cleaning up the trails. I'm just piling up all this brush into a pile. There's small crevices for the mice to get into. The rabbits can get away from danger. Squirrels. All these different animals are using it. And, of course, the birds. Yeah, they dart in and out of them whenever there's danger around. So these brush piles are kind of a mixture between the two. And I do have some brush piles on my property, but I also have some bird boxes and I plant bushes. And like I said, the woods are not too far from my house as well. Okay, let's talk about feeders. Different types of feeders take different types of food. And once again, you want to get a variety of birds, you want to provide a variety of food. 
But if you only have one feeder out there, it probably will only take one type of food at a time. Some of them won't take certain types of seed either. So if you're putting out a feeder that takes just black oil, sunflower, or maybe a mixed seed, you're limiting yourself to the birds that eat that type of food. You need to think about what to feed. The way to answer that question is, what are you trying to attract? Are you trying to attract hummingbirds? Then get a hummingbird feeder. Are you trying to attract just an average songbird? Then get a black oil sunflower mixed seed feeder. So think about what you're trying to attract to your backyard. What types of birds? And that'll decide what types of feeders to get. Yes, I said feeders. S at the end. A plural. Get a lot of different feeders. And we'll talk about feeders a little more in depth in a second here. When to feed. And you may be thinking, well, what are you talking about, Paul? What do you mean when to feed? Of course, you're going to feed all the time. Well, this is a little bit of a secret. Feeding the birds is not necessarily for the birds. It's for us. Yeah, that's right. We're filling our feeders so that we can see these birds. We can get the awesome experience of watching the birds. Feeding the birds is more for us and partly for the birds. Yeah, the birds do benefit, of course, but they're finding feed out there. There's plenty of food for them. Well, in the winter time, it does get harsh. It's a little bit harder for some of them to find food. That's why a lot of birds migrate south. They head south for the winter where the food's more abundant, more available. But we are helping them out a little bit. But it's more for us. Why do you think we hang the feeders close to our window where we can see them? Why do you think we don't put them in the woods somewhere? They're finding food out there, but we want to see them. So the feeding is more for us. So my recommendation is feed all the time so that you can see the birds all the time. I get some people who will stop feeding in the winter time, and they say it's because it's too tough to get to their feeders. What I do, I actually snow blow a trail over to my feeders so that it's easy enough to fill them in the winter time, or I trudge through the deep snow in my boots getting over to the feeders. But that's when the birds need it the most is in the winter time. So what's that mean, Paul? You don't feed in the summer because they don't need it as much? Well, yeah, feed in the summer. Once again, it's for us, not for the birds so much. So feed the food in the summer and the winter, year round. Feed them all the time. That's my opinion. Feed them whenever you can. And where to feed them? I know this sounds like another one of those silly questions. Obviously, you're going to put them somewhere you, where you can watch them. Once again, they're for us. The feeders are so that we can see the birds up close. So where are we going to put our feeders? Well, there's a lot of amateur mistakes that people make. Like, let's put it right on our porch. Are you going to clean up the mess? Birds plus feeders equals mess. Yeah, they will make a mess. The seeds are going to drop down on the ground. The birds are going to go to the bathroom. Yes, it's actually, they've done a study and they have found that one of the last things that a bird does when it takes off in flight is go to the bathroom. They have to get rid of that extra weight Flying is all about weight. It's being lightweight. If you're heavy, you're not going to get up in the air. So they go to the bathroom just before they take off. That's going to be on your porch if you put your feeders on your porch. And I've made the mistake in the past of putting a feeder in my garden. The black oil sunflower, it's supposed to be treated in a way that it won't germinate, but it does. Sometimes we get these sunflowers growing in our flower garden, and that's because some of them don't make it safely through that process, I guess. If you want to grow these sunflowers in your garden, if you want to mess in your garden, then go ahead, put them in your garden. My recommendation is to keep them out in the yard somewhere where you don't mind the mess so much. Some place where you don't have to clean up the mess as much. 
Be careful where you place your feeders. That's what I mean by where. And always try to keep your feeders at least five feet from your house, from your windows. And the reason for that is because of window strikes. I see people buying these window feeders. I even listened to a podcast the other day. It made me shudder. The two guys were talking back and forth, and they talked about, oh, yeah, I've got a window feeder. You should get a window feeder. It's awesome seeing the birds come right up to your window. Not so awesome when they hit the window. All of a sudden, a Sharpshund hawk or a Cooper's hawk comes flying in, and the birds are scattering, and they're just trying to get away from danger. They don't know what glass is, and they fly right into that window. Do not Buy these feeders, please. If you have one, break it, throw it out. Don't even give it to someone else. Just get rid of it, break it, put it in the recycle bin. These feeders are terrible for the bird. Okay, off my soapbox. Uh, let's continue on, talk about specific feeders. Now, they do sell these feeders out there that are kind of in a cylinder shape. They're made from a very fine wire mesh. And that's because the seed that you put in these feeders are actually a very fine seed. It's called thistle feed. It's also known as Niger seed. Now, thistle feed or Niger seed, make sure you get it fresh. Buy it in a small batch or if you buy it in larger batches, keep it in a plastic bag. It doesn't stay fresh forever and then the birds don't like it if it's not fresh. And the thistle feeder is going to attract goldfinch, housefinch, purple finch, siskins. So your smaller finch-like birds, they're the ones who like eating the thistle. And then you can also get a mixed seed or a sunflower seed. Now these feeders have larger holes in them, and I've seen them designed in different aspects. Some will have tops that open and you pour it in. Some are beautiful cylinder shape. Others look like a little house. So they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. These types of feeders will take either a mixed seed or a sunflower seed. Now, what I mean by a mixed seed, usually mixed seed will have a variety of different seeds in it. They'll have black oil, sunflower, um, maybe some thistle in there, maybe some cracked corn, some, you know, just a wide variety of seeds all mixed together. Now, the only reason I don't use a mixed seed is because I find the larger birds like blue jays, they'll come along and they want to get that one black oil sunflower seed. They've got their eye on that one. And so what do they do to get to it? They just shovel the rest of it aside. They don't want that small stuff. Yuck, that's terrible. So they just shovel it aside. So you've got more of a mess on the ground. I have found that it's a messier seed when you start dealing with mixed seeds. Yet I do have friends who they swear by it. They love the mixed seed because they say it gets them a variety of birds. And if you have a small yard or a small area, maybe you live in an apartment, and you want to start feeding the birds and you want to get a wide variety, but you don't have room for a lot of different feeders, maybe you want to get a mixed seed then you'll get a lot of different birds, more than just the black oil sunflower. Now, the sunflower seed, that attracts a lot of different types of birds. Finches, jays, like your blue jay, your chickadees, your titmice, your cardinals. I actually have a cardinal sitting at my feeder right now as I'm watching out my window. Uh, there's a blue jay out there also at the sunflower seed. I got a couple of juncos. Um, so you'll get cardinals, grosbeaks, juncos, sparrows, buntings. So a lot of variety of birds come to the mixed seed and the sunflower seed. So my recommendation is if you don't have a lot of room, you only want to buy one type of feeder, this is the type of feeder to get. Because a wide variety of birds love that sunflower. And you can get sunflower kernels where it doesn't have the husk. It doesn't make as much a mess. But it's quite expensive buying it that way. 
Now, another type of feeder that I always have, especially in the winter time, peanut feeders. A peanut feeder, once again, they usually come in a cylinder shape with a wire mesh, but it's not as fine a wire as your thistle feeders. It's a much wider wire. And that's because you're putting the peanuts inside here and the birds peck through it and pull the peanuts out. Now you can get the peanuts in the shell or you can get them out of the shell. Now, if you're getting peanuts in the shell, please make sure you get them unsalted. Usually if you go to a feed store or some sort of wildlife store, they will have the peanuts that are unsalted, the ones for feeding the birds. Now in the shell, you're gonna have a mess. Yeah, they're usually a little less expensive, but you're gonna have a mess on the ground. I get the shelled out of the shell and it makes much less of a mess. The birds seem to enjoy it more. They seem to be easier getting at it. So that's why I get that type. Now, why do I feed the peanut feeders? Well, it gets more of a variety if you're feeding another type of seed like the peanuts. A lot of woodpeckers. Yeah, that's what I always detract to my peanut feeders. They love the peanuts. So with a peanut feeder, you're going to get woodpeckers. You're going to get different jays. You're going to get crows too. That's why I had the crows earlier coming into my feeders because they come to my suet and my peanuts. Now, I also get uh, tip mice, nut hatches, wrens, creepers, and juncos. So a lot of different birds like the peanuts. But the main reason I offer peanuts at my feeders is because I love seeing all the woodpeckers. And I get a wide variety of woodpeckers at my feeders too. I get the red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, I've had a red-headed woodpecker. Mostly I will get the downy woodpeckers and the hairy woodpeckers. Those are the most common that I get at my peanut feeders. I have also had pileated woodpeckers coming to my peanut feeders. So you will get a wide variety of woodpeckers at your peanut feeders. And of course, there's also suet feeders. Now, there is something you have to know about suet. It comes in a wide variety. You can go to your local supermarket often and get a natural suet. Suet is basically the fat from an animal. So when they're trimming the fat at the supermarket and they have all that extra fat just hanging out, what do they do with it? They shove it in a bag and they put it out for sale and the birders grab it up. Now, if you're using a natural suet, make sure you change it often. So only put small amounts out because if it sits out too long in the summertime in the heat of the sun, it's going to rot. Remember, it's animal fat. So it will rot and the birds won't touch it and you're not going to want to go outside because your yard's going to stink from it. It'll smell like rotting meat. So feed it in small amounts. If you're feeding in the winter, you don't have to worry too much about it. Because the suet won't go bad in the wintertime. It's like it's in the freezer. It's in the refrigerator. So feeding in the winter is fine. But in the summertime, my recommendation is go with the suet cakes. So they make cakes of suet. It comes in a wide variety where you pack it. They Well, you don't. They do. The company does. They pack it into these cake shapes. You can put it into a suet feeder where it's usually got wire mesh on both sides or one side. I have a special suet feeder that I bought only because I was going through suet like crazy. I would have the starlings coming in. I would have the blue jays coming in eating that suet. And I don't mind seeing them, but I give them other food. They shouldn't be eating my suet, which I have for my nut hatches and my woodpeckers. So I bought a suet feeder that looks like a little miniature short house. And you lift up the top, you put the suet in, and there's wire mesh on the bottom. So the woodpeckers can fly up from underneath and they can hang on upside down and eat the suet. But the other birds can't. It prevents those larger birds from eating it and therefore I don't go through as much suet. 
I still provide foods for the other guys. But these suet cakes, they have them in a wide variety. Some have berries in them. Some have fruit in them. A couple of years ago, actually it was several years ago, I bought an orange suet. I had the hardest time. I don't know why, but I had the hardest time getting Orioles to my yard. I could hear them in the woods. I heard them singing all the time in the woods, but I couldn't get them to come to my feeders. Yes, I did put out oranges. They wouldn't come. Someone told me, put grape jelly out. So I put grape jelly out for them. They wouldn't come. Someone told me, well, you're using the wrong grape jelly. You have to buy the brand name. You can't buy generic grape jelly. Really? The birds are that picky? So I tried it anyhow. Put out the brand name grape jelly. They still didn't come. I was ready to give up. And then finally, I went down to my local feed store. And they had an orange suet. Now, this orange suet, I just put it out, and sure enough, the next day, I had Orioles. After that, I started feeding the orange suet all the time, but I also started putting oranges out, and they loved the oranges as well. So I just needed to draw them in with that orange suet, and then they continued on from there coming to my yard. Now, when you're buying the suet cakes, make sure it says on them year-round if you're feeding in the summertime. So your suet feeders, they will attract things like woodpeckers, flickers, jays, crows, titmice, chickadees, warblers, and tanagers. Warblers are a tough bird to get to come to a bird feeder. And the reason I say that is because warblers are insectivores. They don't like coming to feeders that have peanuts in them or black oil. They don't eat that stuff. They eat bugs. The warblers aren't around in the wintertime for that reason. But they do make suet that does have insect parts in them, and it attracts these warblers to it. So once you know what type of birds you want to get, that's the type of foods you are going to put out. Now, there are other types of feeders, too. Let's say you don't have a lot of room, and you want to feed a variety. You don't have room to put out a dozen bird feeders. I actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different feeders out. Four of them are black oil or mixed seed feeders. And I have a suet feeder, I have a peanut feeder, and I have a thistle feeder. So I have a wide variety of feeders. Maybe you don't have room. They actually make feeders that will have a middle compartment where you put your mixed seed or your black oil sunflower. And then on the side, it has a place for peanuts. And on the other side, a place for suet cake. So you can actually get a variety. And I have seen some that have a division in the middle compartment. So you can feed one type of food on one side and another type on the other side. So maybe a mixed seed on one side, black oil on the other. So you have all these different types of feeders that you have the option of. And of course, there are specialty feeders out there too. Now, these specialty feeders are like hummingbird feeders. So if you're trying to get hummingbird, they're a nectar eater. So you want to hang these with like a sugar water in them. Don't put food coloring in the hummingbird feeder. Food coloring is an artificial coloring and it will affect the bird over time. Just put a natural sugar in there, not a processed sugar. Put a natural sugar in the hummingbird feeder, sugar water, and then just put it in the feeder without coloring it. Most feeders, most hummingbird feeders will have a red or an orange base to them, and that attracts the birds to them. And they do sell Oriole feeders as well. I did visit a nature center once where they had both an Oriole feeder and a hummingbird feeder out. And the Oriole was at the hummingbird feeder and the hummingbird feeder at the Oriole feeder. I would not recommend getting both. Just get one or the other. Just my recommendation. And if you're trying to get bluebirds, bluebirds are another insectivore. You can go out and you can get mealworms in the springtime and you put them into a dish. 
But some other birds might steal all those mealworms as well. So if you're just trying to get the bluebirds, it's going to be a little bit tough to keep the other birds away from that delicious mealworm. And of course, there's also platform feeders. Maybe you'll enjoy getting the big birds like the crows and the blue jays. If you enjoy getting them, they have trouble at some of these smaller feeders hanging on. They're a big bird. And here you're given this tiny little area to perch onto and try to get the food. If you want to get these bigger birds, get a platform feeder. Basically what a platform feeder is, is it's got a platform, a piece of plywood, or a wire mesh base. And the birds can stand on that larger area. And that way they can spread their wings much easier. Now, one thing I do want to mention about platform feeders, make sure they are well drained. If you make your own and you put a little lip around the side to keep the seed from falling onto the ground, make sure you drill holes in the bottom or you make the bottom with a wire mesh so that if it rains, the water can drip through and it doesn't stand in a puddle. If you have seed sitting in a puddle, it's going to rot. It's going to get moldy. And it will make the bird sick. So always make sure a platform feeder has drainage. Now let's talk about some of the other visitors that will come to your feeders. Yes, if you are going to feed the birds, you're going to get other visitors. For instance, mice. I came home one day and I saw a mouse hanging from one of my feeders. And he was just trying to get a good meal. I've had red squirrels at my feeders. I don't get gray squirrels around my property. It's, it's strange. I'm close enough to the woods, I figured I would, but I get the red squirrels only. Chipmunks, I've had chipmunks. They're usually on the ground eating the fallen seed, and you will sometimes get hawks as well. If you're feeding the songbirds, you're also feeding the hawks, or at least you're providing them with food. There's certain types of hawks and falcons out there as well, who eat other birds. Falcons are a bird eater. Occipiter hawks like the Cooper's hawk and the sharp hawk, they're also bird eaters. So they are hanging around. They see a, a feast of birds all in one area. They're coming down to get their feast, to get their dinner. So if you're feeding birds, you probably will get hawks at one time or another or falcons like the kestrel falcon. I get calls every year, people calling me saying, hey, how do I get rid of these nasty birds? And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, I'm feeding the birds and I've got all these nasty birds coming down and eating the other birds. I said, oh, you got a hawk. Describe it to me. And they tell me the size and I finally figure out, okay, you got a Cooper's hawk. And they're like, yeah, so how do I get rid of it? If you want to get rid of a hawk or a falcon, at your feeders, stop feeding the birds. Now, before I get all the DMs and the messages, and I don't mean permanently, just temporarily. Empty your feeders out. Stop feeding the birds. They'll go away. There's no food. Remember at the beginning of the podcast, I told you, one of the reasons that you can attract birds to your yard is for food. You give them food, they're going to come to your yard. So if you get rid of all the food for them, they're not going to come. They're going to be out in the woods. They're still hanging out out there. They're finding their own food, but they're not coming in close to your house anymore. Out in the open, in the danger zone. The hawks who are hanging around, you know, they're seeing all these birds. They've got a new place to get a feast every single day. The birds disappear. No, the hawks have no food they're going to disappear too. Once the hawks are gone, then you can start feeding the birds again. And then it'll take a little while maybe, but the songbirds will start coming back again. And if it all happens again where you get another hawk, just stop feeding them for a short period of time. Usually it's only for like three days, maybe four days. That's enough for the hawks to decide, okay, my feast is gone. This is not such a great place to hang out. I'm going to check out the neighbors or maybe next town over. That's the easiest way to get rid of these birds. But remember, you invited them. 
Now, if you're going to feed the birds, I always recommend getting the good field guide if you want to know what they are. I mean, honestly, I hate naming things only because as soon as you name them, you've lost interest in them. Oh, there is a pileated woodpecker. Next time it comes, it's not such a big deal. Yeah, instead of naming it, I like to just watch them and enjoy them. Watch their habits. Watch how that chickadee flutters from the tree over, grabs a piece of seed, goes up into the crack of of the tree and wedges that seed down there so he can break through the shell easily with his beak. And then he flies off. Then he comes back. Then he flies off. Then he goes up into that crack again. Place the seed in there. I mean, it's fun to watch these guys. That's what I recommend. But if you want to name them, if you want to know what birds are actually coming to your feeders, get a good field guide. Don't just go out and buy a field guide. Borrow one. And I always say this because field guides are different. One field guide may have photographs. Another field guide may have drawings. One field guide may have a lot of information about the bird. Another one might just have identification of the bird. It all depends on what you like. So I always recommend borrowing field guides. See what type you like before you go out and buy your own. And of course, there are a lot of field guides online nowadays. So make sure you get a decent field guide so that you can start seeing what birds are hanging out in your backyard. And the last thing I want to talk about is citizen science. Now that you've learned how to attract these birds to your yard and you're starting to enjoy watching the bird, why not help the scientists out? What is citizen science? Citizen science is basically backyard conservation. You're helping scientists in places where they can't be. Scientists can't be everywhere. If they're studying the birds, they're not going to go into everyone's backyard and start studying them. Instead, they depend on us, the everyday average citizen out there watching the birds, keeping track of who's at their bird feeders, writing down what birds visited this day, and then they send it off to a database somewhere where the scientists can look at that database, put all the information together, and learn what they need to from that information that we gathered. So that's what citizen science is all about. And if you have feeders in your yard, there's a lot of different citizen science programs that you can get involved in. For instance, there's the Birdhouse Network, Project Feeder Watch, Project Pigeon Watch if you live in the city, and one of my favorites is eBird. eBird is an app you put on your phone or you can do it on your computer and you just Watch the birds. Keep track of them. Any amount of time. Maybe you have 10 minutes and you want to just sit at your window and watch your birds. And you start keeping track of them. Put them into eBird. And then when you're done, you just click the stop button. Fill out a little more information. And they have all your data. You can also go into eBird and study what birds are in your area. By looking at all the data other people have put in. And of course, another one I do each year is the Christmas bird count. If you are in a Christmas bird count circle, as they call it, you can get a hold of whoever runs that circle and let them know, hey, I've got a yard right in your circle. I've got bird feeders. I've got tons of birds that come here. I'm willing to help you out by keeping track of what birds are coming that weekend. So the Christmas bird count happens around Christmas time every year. Go to the Audubon website, put in the search Christmas bird count, and they'll have a map of all the circles, as they call them, areas where they count the birds is basically what a circle is. They have a map of all the circles, and you might actually be inside one of the circles, and they'll have all the contact information. It's a fun thing to do. And another one I participate in every February, the Great Backyard Bird Count. Listen to the podcast I did on it if you want more information, but it's kind of like the Christmas Bird Count. It's usually the second weekend in February, and you count birds from Friday through Monday. Not every single day, all day long, but at least for 15 minutes each of those days, or just one of those days, however much time you have, 
There's more information online. Go to birdcount.org and you can find out more about it. So once you get these bird feeders set up in your yard, get a bird bath, get some sort of shelter, you're going to find you have a lot more visitors coming to your yard. Enjoy watching them. Don't try to name them right away. Just start enjoying watching them. And then you can start discovering what birds are hanging out. Right now, I just had a flock of starlings come in. I've got about 30 starlings who just flew in. I've got a male and female hairy woodpecker. I've got a female downy woodpecker. I've got about six juncos. I've got a cardinal. I've got a blue jay. I've got a red-bellied woodpecker just showed up. So I've got quite a wide variety of birds at my bird feeders. And I'm really enjoying watching them. We've come to the end of the episode today. I hope you enjoyed wandering through nature with me. Don't forget to invite your nature-loving friends to join us. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and take a minute to rate and review the podcast. If you have any nature questions or ideas for future episodes, feel free to drop me a DM on my Instagram page at the Nature Wanderer with underscores in between each word, or my website at naturewanderer.org. You can also support the podcast by joining my Patreon, or you can go to the Spotify link that's found in the show notes, and that will allow you to make a donation to the podcast so that I can keep doing the podcast and it helps actually pay for future podcasts as well. You can also show your support of the podcast by buying the Nature Wander t-shirts, mugs, backpacks, puzzles, and much more. The link to my store is on my website, which once again is naturewander.org. Have a great week and keep exploring the nature around you. Mm-hmm.